Today, Mike Gaskins, author of In the Name of the Pill, joins me to talk about the history of hormonal contraception. Mike, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited for this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to it as well. To begin with, what what started you down this journey to writing this book? Well, <laughs> to to go back, I, I think my first real interest as far as really diving into research on birth control started. I was um, I, I work in media and and live events, and I was doing a live event uh, on autoimmune disease for doctors of all different specialties, and it was continuing medical education for them, and. Um, since it was kind of a, a, a you know a wide subject talking about all autoimmune diseases, the first night um, as a keynote speaker, they had Dr. Noel Rose uh, give the presentation, and he's known as the father of autoimmune disease. He was um, studying Hashimoto's thyroiditis in rabbits in the late '50s, and came up with this idea of the body's immune system attacking itself, uh, and he gave it the name autoimmune disease. And so as he's as he's describing kind of the broad strokes of, of of autoimmunity, he's talking about we've known from the beginning estrogen plays a key role of, because what it does in a woman's immune system. And he's talking about T cells and he says they're the soldiers of the immune system. And when our natural estrogen attaches to these soldiers, that gives them their marching orders. And so when things get in our body that mimic natural estrogen, suddenly that soldier is armed and it's ready to attack, but it doesn't know what to attack because it wasn't our natural estrogen. So that message is kind of missing. So it just starts attacking healthy tissue. And uh, so as he kept talking about these chemi chemicals that mimic natural estrogen, I, I didn't know about endocrine disruptors at the time. And I thought, well, he has to be talking about birth control. It was the only thing I could think of that was actually designed to mimic natural es estrogen. And uh, so I like I Googled as he was talking, I Googled rise of autoimmune disease. And I found all these diseases since 1970 had just started skyrocketing. And I thought, wow, this he's talking like this is common knowledge. Why haven't I heard this before? Um, so I, I told the audio guy, I was like, I want to take the mic off him. I'm, I'm really fascinated about this. And so I went up to talk to him. And, and as I was taking his mic, I said, so what role does birth control play in, in you know, the incidence of autoimmunity? And he said, oh, none at all. And uh, I was kind of taken aback. I said, that, that makes no sense based on everything you just said. It's, it seems counterintuitive. And he, he doubled down. He said, no, there's never been any evidence linking it to any of these diseases. And I believed him, you know, because he's the father of autoimmune disease. Uh, so, but I was still thinking about it when I got back to my hotel room that night. And so I just, I picked lup lupus out of thin air and I Googled lupus plus oral contraceptives. And I found an article uh, showing, you know, talking about a recent study that found that women who take birth control are 50% more likely to be diagnosed with lupus than women who don't use birth control. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, it's a relatively new study. Maybe Dr. Rose hasn't heard of it. I'll, I'll look for him tomorrow at the conference and share it with him. You know, so I, you know, I think I've discovered this thing, but I, I keep reading the article and I get halfway down and they've interviewed him asking him about this study. And he says, well, this, this doesn't mean women should stop taking birth control. And for me, that was a real eye-opening moment, you know, cause it was, I really questioned everything, you know, it's like, why would he lie to me? And, you know, is, is he in pharmaceutical pocket? You know, what's, you know, what's, what's going on? Why would he insist that there's no research? Uh, and it just, it, I kind of dived into the rabbit hole after that and started looking at all these different diseases that we never hear about uh, that have been, you know, tied to birth control. And incidentally, a lot of them still aren't even included on patient information pamphlets that, that come with a pill. So women who do want to be informed and make an informed you know, decision aren't given that opportunity because so much of this research, I mean, there's mountains of evidence and it's, you know, it's, it's still not included. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to have been asked to grow, uh, join a group of physicians, a lot of people way smarter than me, a, a lot of them are, you know, Ivy League professors and, and, and things of that such, I, and MDs and PhDs. Um, and we've petitioned the uh, FDA to change their language and their patient information pamphlets. Wow, that is incredible. So, so much of what you just said resonates so strongly with me because, uh, you know, my background, I am a scientist and I talk about endocrine disruptors all the time. And it, it seriously, and just as part of like Rain Organica's message and Rain Organica is relatively new brand on the scene. It was launched in 2020, but that's what did it for me. It was all of a sudden there was this switch. There was like this little voice in my head going, 
you know, you are voluntarily taking the biggest endocrine disruptor known to man every single day. Right. And it took, but it took me talking about it to trigger that recognition that, oh yeah, this, the synthetic hormones in oral contraceptives or in any kind of hormone contraceptive are endocrine disruptors. So, but I, I love what you just said. I love that you're petitioning the FDA with this. Can you talk a little bit more about that group? Yeah, it's a, it's a group that had, had got together and then my book came out and a, a gentleman that I've worked with on a few things asked me if I would be interested in joining them. Uh, and they, they largely had the petition drafted when I joined in. Uh, but I really appreciate the the sincere approach that they've taken to it. You know, I, I brought up a couple of other, um, so what it is, is you looked at all these different studies. So we, you know, look at breast cancer and look at every study we could to, to determine. And we presented the, the ones that agreed with our position and then the ones that didn't just to say, here's the full volume of what's out there. Um, because we know, you know, not all research is, is created equal, right? But we're saying, right. here's what's, here's what's peer reviewed. Here's what's been published. There's a vast, overwhelming percentage of these that tend toward this opinion that it is a big factor in breast cancer, um, you know. And then we included, you know, lupus and and um, Crohn's disease and, and, and you know and several other diseases. Uh, and then we also petitioned to remove the EPO from the market just because there are so many options out there, and depo is just so much more dangerous uh, and causes so much more damage and injury to to women who take it that it's there's no re reason to really even have it on the market. Um, uh, so that that's kind of the gist behind it. And it's it's it was four years ago we submitted it, and it we're, it's very slow going with the FDA as you might expect. Um, they did recently give us a partial response on the breast cancer and say that they are going to require uh, the drug makers to change their language. It's still not as strong as we would like it to be, um, but it's a little stronger. Um, and even the National Cancer Institute recently came out and they changed their language about breast cancer to be much stronger and even much stronger than what the, the revised FDA uh, requirement is going to be. But we're, we feel like we're slowly making progress. We're still trying to urge them to look at the rest of these diseases and, it, and at least include, uh, you know, some of these other diseases that aren't even mentioned in, in most patient information pamphlets. So speaking of the packet, patient in, of the package insert or the prescribing information or whatever you want to call it, uh, patient information. I like the um, PI. I think we just stick with that. That makes it easy. Yeah. The PI. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so let's, let's kind of deep dive into that for just, for just a second here, because the cardiovascular, um, events, those are like, there, there's actually tables saying, Hey, here's your increased risk breast cancer. I, I feel like they do a decent job already, but some of these like gallbladder disease, autoimmune, um, diabetes, the, the link there, like, could we maybe talk about some of these other like broader class, it, it, I mean, especially autoimmune and, and gallbladder. Sure, sure. And I mean, I think that's the thing. It's when you start diving into it. I mean, for me, like you mentioned, you're a scientist. I'm not. And, 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 and I use that as an obstacle. That's, I held myself back for a long time because I, I said all those things. It's like, you're not an MD, you're not a woman, you're not a PhD, you know, it's like, what business do you have talking about this? Um, but I just, I had so much of this stuff I was uncovering and I felt like nobody's really talking about this. And, and so I felt like it was worth taking a chance. And, and like you say, there's just, there's so much it gets, it gets lost, you know, breast cancer is a pretty easy target, but yeah, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned gallbladder disease. I mean, I feel like just, and this is just anecdotally from the number of women that I've talked to and encountered through, you know, various forms of communication. To me, it feels like gallbladder is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. I think the new generation of, of progesterones, progestins, uh, are, seem to be a lot more dangerous for the gallbladder and liver. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot more about liver adenomas and gallstones and things like that from women. And I just can't help but feel that that's something that's gotten worse in recent years, but we never talk about it. We never talk about glaucoma and how it's tied to birth control or skin cancer uh, or all these things. Um, and I remember I interviewed a doctor who, who gained some notoriety during the, the pandemic. His name's Dr. Uh, Zach Bush. I talked to him years ago before, before the pandemic because he had written 
a, uh, a paper that was published at the University of Virginia when, when he was there telling women that if, if you have a history, a personal history or a family history even of, of migraines, you should stay away from horm hormonal birth control. And I was just so blown away when I found that document. I was like, wow, nobody says this, especially nobody with a name D after their name. Yeah. So why did he say that? Well, based on research and he, you know, he had cited, uh, you know, different studies that, sh that showed that women who take birth control, you know, women who take birth control are, I forget the numbers he used. Uh, I want to say up to eight times more likely to suffer a stroke. Um, okay. So it was who don't suffer from migraines, right? So whether okay. you have migraines prior to, or as a result of taking birth control, the moment you have migraines or even a family history, he was saying, stay away from it. It's not worth the risk because you're raising your risk so much more exponentially by taking these drugs of having a stroke or a blood clot. Um, and, you know, okay. blood clot could play out as pulmonary embolism or, or whatever. Um, so he was basically saying, just stay away from it. And um, and so when I talked to him, I asked him, you know, I said, what what made you specifically focus on on migraines? And he said, well, it's an easy tackle. Right. He said, because we can talk about breast cancer and heart disease and those things that come years down the road. Mm -hmm. But there's always that. Was it really caused by the birth control? What other factors were in play? Oh, that won't happen to me. It's really easy to kind of dismiss that and, and think it's not going to happen to you. But something like migraines is a pretty instant thing. You know, if you're already suffering from migraines, it's easy to say stay away from these drugs. Or if you take it and start having really bad headaches, it's pretty easy to recognize that immediately. And determine cause and effect. So for him, that was why, you know, I, that's why I think a lot of these kind of instantaneous things are are pretty easy targets to go after and say, hey, this, you know, this is what, whereas something like gallbladder or, you know, the other things yeah. we discussed, they're, they're not as easily associated. And, and because of the time and latency involved, it can be easier to kind of dismiss it and say, well, maybe it wasn't that. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. So I wanted to kind of dive in. So your book, which I have not read yet, it is on my, it's on my list. Um, however, I've heard you talk about it enough to know that you kind of dive into the history of the pills approval. And could we maybe talk a little bit about that? Because it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a sordid history and a, an exception for the FDA for approval. Yeah, for me, it was really startling uh, and alarming. Uh, so just not to get too deep into how I got there, but I, I contacted, there's a gentleman named uh, Morton Mentz who wrote a book in 1969 uh, uh, called The Pill, An Alarming Report. And he was a reporter for the Washington Post and he was often on Face the Nation and everything. I mean, pretty big credentials for a journalist. And he had covered the Supreme Court and then when the pill came out, he started covering the pill and he wrote a lot of wonderful articles diving into, you know, questioning the safety and how did these things get approved and, and things of that nature. And then, he, like I said, he wrote the book. Well, I found an email address for him and I thought, I'm going to try it and see if it's still active and emailed him. And like within 10 minutes, he said, I'd love to talk to you. Um, he said, but I'll warn you, I'm 93 years old and I've forgotten mountains of stuff. And, um, and so I called him up and we talked. And after a few conversations, he contacted me with Ben Gordon, who was Senator Gaylord Mel Nelson's right-hand man during the Nelson pill hearings. And he was 102 when we met, but still sharp wow. as a tack. I could not believe his memory. So I went and met with him several times. Every time I would go to DC, I would go and meet with him. And he ended up giving me his hard copy of the congressional hearings. And um, wow. so that's, for me, that's kind of how I got into the history. I wasn't really looking into the history that much, but I just kind of fell into it. And then once I had the Nelson Pill hearings and started reading through that, it just, it, it blew my mind really. And it still does. It, 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 the fact that these drugs were proved and they've still not been proven safe to this day, they've never been proven safe and yet they were approved. And when I started diving into it, it was, it was almost, I had to wrestle with, do I want to stay away from this subject or I don't want to dive into it until I had enough evidence. Because when I first started realizing what was happening, I thought this, this sounds conspiratorial. This, this could make me sound like a whack job, you know, <laughs> but it's true. You know, sometimes conspiracies really are true because at the Nelson Pill hearings, you had several leading physicians and FDA regulators who admitted that 
they changed the benefit to risk paradigm for this drug. You know, the benefit to risk is supposed to be solely focused on the patient, but to get the, the pill approved, they looked at the benefit to society versus the risks, risk to the patient. And in their view, the risk, I mean, the benefit to society was population growth was out of control and something had to be done. And so they were willing basically to take the chance on sacrificing some women in order to reduce population growth because they felt like it was such a threat to the planet. That, I mean, it's impossible to put into words what that makes me feel as a woman who has taken um, birth control. Because, I mean, it's not just... <laughs> It's not just sacrificing lives. It's not just, oh, they're going to have a stroke and fall over dead. No, this is like, it's, it's, it's not just more bit. It, it's the whole quality of life aspect of it. And it's where I'm sitting now having an autoimmune condition, having had my gallbladder removed, having as soon as I stopped taking oral contraceptives, a problem with blood sugar metabolism. I mean, that's three yeah. huge things. And that right there, I think is like, for me, at least it's directly linked to oral contraception, because when I stopped, I'd never had a problem with sugar dysregulation before I stopped taking the pill. And within two weeks, I had a problem with sugar dysregulation. Like for me, that's correlation. Um, you know, whether, whether I can find studies or not. Um, so this right. is like, this is profound what you're saying. This is it's essentially like a war against women. It, it is. It's very much a war against women. And I'm sure they don't see it that way. I mean, I mean well, I, I don't know how else you could look at it. I don't know what they're thinking. Honestly, I don't know what they're thinking other than, I, I mean, I, you can be blinded by by fear or, you know, if they truly believe the world is at risk and it's teetering on just falling out of control, you say, okay, we may have to sacrifice a few people to turn this around. And that, that was kind of their mindset. You know, it's not one I, I think I would ever feel comfortable agreeing with, but that's, that's kind of the approach they took. Um, and I agree with it. And that's the thing for me is it, the people who still deny it today. It's like, if you read the Nelson pill hearings, it's like reading a prophetic book, you know, all of these doctors coming in, there was a doctor who talked about, he, he had started calling it, uh, uh, chemical diabetes in, in women who were coming in talking yeah. about their metabolism changes. So he, he labeled it chemical diabetes. There was a doctor who talked about, uh, um, I'm trying to remember all the terms they used, uh, suppression syndrome. What did he call it? I forget, but talking about infertility, women who take it for a while and then they stop and then their fertility never comes back. They're never able, never yeah. able to have children again, uh, um, over suppression syndrome. That was what he called it. So it was basically an atrophy of, you know, of, of, of the, reproductive system by it being out of commission for so long. Um, but then you also had the doctors who talked about, you know, the breast cancer, you know, at that time, one out of every 20 women was diagnosed with breast cancer. And today, one out of every eight women, and they talked about we could see a rise as bad as I think they said 20%. And if we do, that's a horrible tragedy. Well, we've seen over 200%, you know, rise. And so if you just read through those, it's really alarming <laughs> in lupus, you know, lupus was such a rare disease at the time and it was considered an old person's disease. I mean, the people who testified actually had to explain to the congressman what lupus was. And wow. so they're describing this rare disease and how they're suddenly starting to see it in young women. And that never happened before. And, and some of the women, when they stopped taking the pill, the lupus symptoms went away. And then when they started again, they came back. So they knew there was a direct correlation there. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you just, you just read through those hearings and then you look at what's happened today. It's, it's, you have to be crazy not to see the link and accept that, okay, they knew what they were talking about because we're seeing yeah. those things come to fruition that, that they predicted. Wow. So are those pill hearings, I mean, are they in the public domain? Can you access them? Um, I believe you can. I can't remember where it is. I know, um, there's one woman who um, her her daughter had died from blood clots uh, very young, I think 19 or 20 years old. And she was she was a real firecracker, a real go getter. And she went to I think it was Bernie Sanders office and uh, was able to file a Freedom of Information Act. Um, 
and they got them released. I think there were a couple of pages that were omitted when they released. I don't know if that was on purpose or by accident, but they are available somewhere. Um, I'm sure if you search online, it's, it's probably relatively easy to find. Um, okay. But I, I, ju I just can't remember the exact location right now. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's a fascinating read. I, and, and the the name of the, I don't know if they're, it's released under Nelson Pill hearings or not. The name of the overall hearings was Competitive Problems in the Drug Industry. Um, and so the Nelson Pill hearings were a short part of that overall hearing. Uh, but yeah, okay. it's it's definitely worth looking at. It's it's really fascinating to to look at what the doctors back then were saying about the pill. Okay. And as part of that research, uh, you uncovered or maybe, I mean, maybe as part of those hearings, um, you, I mean, you and you unearthed some really interesting stuff just related to like blood plasma. Uh, yeah. So, so in the book that I start out the chapter, I talk about these doctors who uh, at the university of Pennsylvania, they were in the operating room in, in 2008. Um, and the an anesthesiology received in anesthesia, ah, sorry, anesthesiologist received a unit of blood plasma that was a vivid green color and plasma is usually straw yellow. So he was taken aback by it, showed it to the other doctors in the operating room and none of them had ever seen anything like it before. And so they rejected it and had the blood bank, even though the blood bank told them it told them it was fine. They rejected it and asked them to send a new unit, but they took pictures of it. And afterwards they showed it around to all of their, you know, all their coworkers, all the other doctors on, in, you know, in their uh, section, 30 doctors showed it to none of them had ever seen anything like it. So they were really curious about it. And they started looking through the literature and they could find nothing on green plasma in all of the literature, except 40 years ago, they found several studies that were being done back in the late sixties, looking at green plasma, trying to get to the bottom of it. And some of those studies, um, you know, showed that, you know, it started appearing when women started taking the birth control, all of a sudden they were getting these units of green plasma. So they associated it immediately to these young women. They finally figured out what was causing the green color. It was this elevated level of ceruloplasmin in their, in their serum. And so uh, ceruloplasmin carries copper throughout the body and that's kind of its primary function and it's got a bluish tint to it so when you have this overabundance of this blue protein inside the straw yellow plasma you've suddenly got a vivid green plasma and so that's what it was but these doctors were the doctors at Penn were curious it's like why has there been nothing else done for 40 years well there was a letter from Barbara Seaman who was a feminist back in the late 60s who wrote a book called The Doctor's Case Against the Pill. And she had also written a six-page letter to Senator Gaylord Nelson when he started his hearings looking into the overall drug industry. And she asked him, she's the one who asked him to look at birth control specifically. Um, and so in her six-page letter, um, and so, so this is kind of where the story began for me. I, I had read her letter all, several times as I was writing the book and doing my research. And when I, I had my book just about ready to publish, there was one chapter I felt was a little weak and didn't quite fit. And I felt if I took it out, it was like the book was incomplete and I was trying to decide what to do. And I went, I decided to go back and read her letter again. And I got to the very end and she wrote, um, she said, and what of this green plasma we're suddenly seeing from young women, doctors at Stanford have said, there's nothing to worry about. And they're telling them to use it in transfusions. But what if we find out later that this was causing problems to people who never took the pill because they were receiving these plasma transfusions? So it jumped out at me when I read the letter. I don't know why I had never noticed it before, but when I'm reading the letter this time, I'm like, green plasma? What is this? So that caused me to go in and do the research. And I found these doctors who had, um, who had gotten the unit in their room. And so the other question she had was, why, Barbara Seaman in her letter, why have doctors suddenly been having their financing pulled? So that kind of explains why all of these studies all of a sudden ended in 1969, that all, all the funding dried up for any studies looking at green plasma. So, wow. you know, it, you can draw your own conclusions why they might suddenly stop looking at this very curious thing that's happening, uh, but they just, they dried up. Was it government funded studies? Um, she wasn't clear on that. Um, 
I'm okay. sh- and, and I'm not sure what the state was back then. I'm not sure how much drug companies were funding actual research uh, compared to today. Um, but either way, their funding disappeared. And so the studies yeah. disappeared. And um, okay. so for me, that was a big, you know, that's one of those things you can really point to and say, okay, it's, it's hard to deny something at least unusual is happening, if not nefarious. It's it's hard to explain how you could have all these studies looking into green plasma and all of a sudden they disappear. And there are still several studies looking at seruloplasmin and how elevated levels and elevated copper levels affect women, uh, you know, in the past 40 years. They just don't tie it quite as directly to the green plasma, which is too easily tied to birth control. And I think that's part of the reason. Um, but there are several studies that show that elevated seruloplasmin levels and elevated copper, level, uh, copper levels lead to anxiety, depression, infertility, hair loss, a lot of the same types of things we see associated with birth control use. Um, and beyond that, the other question that that Barbara Seaman asked seems to kind of answer because I had never heard of Trally before. I don't know if you have. Have you heard of? No. It's transfusion-related acute lung injury. They call it Trally. Okay. And so the first case, let me see if I can find the date. Uh, I want to try to get these. So the first fatality, you know, attributed to Trowley was in 1992. And Trowley is, uh, it, it, it soon, it really quickly became the leading cause of death among transfusion patients. And so what was happening wow. was they determined people were receiving in their plasma, in, in their plasma transfusions, were receiving antibodies that weren't natural to their body. And these antibodies were causing their immune system to kick in and basically kind of reject the plasma that they had been given. And so they were having an alloimmune response as opposed to people whose bodies build these antibodies, you know, internally and they get an autoimmune response. So Trali is an alloimmune response from the, okay. from the, and so they determined that, that um, it was Trali was being caused primarily from donations from women. Okay. They were, and so in 19, I'm sorry, in 2003, the United Kingdom moved to a male predominant policy in their blood donation. So the preference was, especially in plasma to go with male donors only as much as possible. Wow. Right. And in 2007, the United States followed suit. So since 2007, the United States has had a male dominant male predominant policy as far as plasma uh, donations because they like i said they've 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 figured out that trally is being caused from female donations and so at the time their their original hypothesis was that women who get pregnant develop a certain amount of antibodies because of of uh, the father's um proteins in the body, the, they build up a certain amount of antibodies and those antibodies could be in the plasma. Well, what they didn't look at is even this was discussed back in the Nelson pill hearings too. There were antibodies in women who were taking birth control. You know, you can't develop an autoimmune disease without certain antibodies being developed. So that didn't even enter the discussion, but by removing, trying to remove as much as they could of women's plasma from, um, from the blood supply, they thought that they could reduce the number of trolley injuries. And by the way, the doctors from the University of Pennsylvania were able to contact the, the, the blood bank and have them look up that donor who they had gotten the plasma from. And sure enough, it was a healthy 27-year-old female medical student with no prior history of any medical problems uh, minus birth control use. So she was on birth control. So it's, it's pretty clear that the green plasma is very directly associated with uh, with birth control use. Um, and I think that's part of the reason the studies have been, uh, kind of kiboshed. And it's funny that, you know, you might think because, you know, one of the other things they found too, is that, um, because of the, the elevated cellular plasma levels and everything, that blood of, of these women with, with the green plasma is, is, has a high, uh, it's a hypercoagulability level. So it's, 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 it has, a, or as they prefer, how do they say it? Superior hemostasis, right? It really, it clots easily. And so 
the first study on green plasma was actually published in, in 40, 50 years, was actually published in August of last year. And I wrote about it early in the study before it came out in my book. I mentioned they were looking at um, taking green plasma and rather than getting rid of it. So part of the way they got rid of it was the Red Cross finally came out with visual guidelines. So that's why okay. so many of the doctors in in today's operating room had never seen green plasma because now they have these visual guidelines to to basically discard all the green plasma that comes in. So and that happened that happened essentially in in 2003 in in, in the that UK same, and then yeah in that same in realm that same where they're starting to recognize tra uh, trally is is a problem and getting okay. out of hand. Um, and so. There was there was a group of researchers when I was writing my book, I found and they were in the early stages of looking at and performing a study. Um, and their proposition was we should take this green plasma because of its superior hemostasis qualities and reintrodu reintroduce it back into the surgery arena for bleeding patients, patients mm -hmm. who are in danger of bleeding out. Let's use this hypercoagulability to our advantage, transfuse it into these patients and try to stop the bleeding. So for me, it's like, okay, that's great. You're looking at ways to try to heal people, but shouldn't we also be looking at that and say, hey, I wonder if the women who have this green plasma at are yeah. at a higher risk of developing blood clots. Shouldn't we be considering that and maybe warning them? You know, is that a test we could use to, to see if a woman's at danger of, of blood clots or copper toxicity or, you know, any of these other things associated with the higher levels of, you know, cellular plasma. But as far as I know, there's no research being done on that. So this is just so fascinating because it also, it has me wondering if the copper IUD also leads to higher levels of, of ceruloplasma. Do you, do you... I, I think so. And that's another thing that, that a, a kind of a, a continuation of my journey. When my book first came out, um, I hadn't written hardly at all about the IUD. Uh, and I probably, I, in, I often say, I think my journey in birth control is like a lot of women's is, you know, I, I started with the doctor lying to me and wondering why he would lie to me. And I've kind of progressed on this journey. And then I finally came to the realization ex and accepted that all these drugs are, are, are unhealthy and, and in the long run are probably not going to be good for the body. And then when my book came out, I was still kind of under the impression that, you know, the copper IUD was probably the safest form of birth control because there were no drugs involved. But then I was overwhelmed with women contacting me when the book came out, asking me if I would write about, uh, the IUD. Um, yeah. and, and so I started reading their stories and, 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 uh, you know, trying to dig into that. And yeah, I mean, there, a lot of the women who get the IUD suffer a lot of the same, you know, same side effects of birth control. And, and I think it is because of that elevated copper level, you know, the, ele the elevation in copper and, and estrogen, there's a, there's a direct correlation there. So whether you're bringing up copper levels by introducing the synthetic estrogens or bringing up estrogen levels by introducing, you know, unnatural copper into the system, I think there, I think there is a very similar uh, risk there of, of copper toxicity and all the things that go along with the, you know, the hair loss and the mental anguish and, and anxiety and all of that. Uh, it's, it's a very real threat, even with the IUD. Okay. Wow. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, there, so there was something that I, uh, that I wanted to ask you about. I don't remember what it was when we were just talking about the green plasma um, yeah, I don't remember specifically what it was. So you're working on another book about the copper IUD? Well, I, I, I was, you're, you're probably referring to the, the interview I did with Lisa, the, um, I think she asked me about it. And at that time I was the, uh, the pandemic, I, I was considering a, a second book. The pandemic kind of changed a lot of, uh, things I'm sure in everybody's world, um, for me, it kind of <laughs> threw everything work and financially related out of whack, and I didn't really have the 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 time and everything to to work on what had really been a passion project um, the way I wanted to. So, essentially, what I did was when I um, when I came out with the audio book, I had these new chapters and and new things I had written about, and I decided rather than just doing a completely new separate second book, I included that in the audio book. 
Um, so the audio book has, has a little bit more information and specifically looking at the IUD um, and some of the other long acting reversible contraceptives uh, that wasn't in the, uh, the original uh, written book. Yeah. Okay. But there may be another book someday, who knows? <laughs> I, can't, I keep thinking I've kind of come to the end of the road and then I discover new things. So it's, a, it's still a growing, evolving thing. Okay. Um, you, so you mentioned earlier liver adenomas. Could we maybe spend a few minutes talking about that? And then the other thing that this is, this is new on my radar, but um, a specific type of like brain tumor known as meningioma. Have you come across that? I've come across it. I, I, and I actually okay. have several little clippings saved in Evernote and keep thinking I'll dig into it one day. And I, it's just one of those things I haven't, it, it has, I guess it hasn't, I haven't come across enough of it that I've, I've, it's made me want to dive into it. Uh, but I do, I, I have definitely seen it pop up. Um, the, uh, oh, you mean the, the liver adenomas. Yeah. That was something that came up really. There was some discussion of, um, you know, the, uh, the effect um, on the liver in the Nelson pill hearings uh, and adenomas. And then on the pill follow-ups, um, there was talk of that, but for me, it, it came onto my radar when, and specifically I had one young woman reach out to me and, and share her story with me of, um, she had been on some of these fourth generation progestins and developed liver adenomas. And it was so, the one was so large that the doctors were afraid to remove it because they told her, um, there was just too much risk of, you know, if, if, if they tried to remove it, she could die on the operating table, but she also ran the risk of any day she could wake up and it could rupture and she could die. So at, I think she was 22 years old at 22 years old, she's waking up every day knowing it could be her last day. And there was really nothing she could do about it. You know, surgery wasn't an option. And, uh, so I, I shared her story and then started looking into it. And again, it's one of those things I feel like I'm hearing more and more with these fourth generation progestins. So it seems like it's it's a problem that's that's only gotten worse. It's, it definitely hasn't gotten better from the you know the first generations of the pill. Yeah. Did do you know? So if she stopped using contraceptives, do you know whether or not it kind of started to reverse? She did stop using them. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's been a couple of years since I since I spoke with her. Um, I I don't think they were shrinking any, but she okay. She had kind of she had kind of the last time I spoke with her, she had come more to terms with it and just okay, I've made it this far. I'm just going to go as far as I can, and I'm not going to let it control my life. Um, and yeah. it was basically, still just kind of trying to learn to to live with it and not let it control her thoughts, you know? And um, so it's still a really sad situation and who knows, you know, that, how long it can play out, you know, so I guess perhaps she could live a long and full life, hopefully, but, uh, but every day she wakes up, I'm sure she's going to have that thought still there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know for me, that was, that was actually a big factor. It wasn't, it wasn't adenomas, but I had a lot of pain, uh, you know, in, in the area of my liver. And I just, I started to really think that it was due to uh, birth control. And then I, it has like, most of that pain has completely resolved since discontinuing birth control. And I know um, I would wake up some mornings and be like, yeah, I look pretty jaundiced today. And that's, that's resolved too. Um, so Right. I, I, you know, I think, you know, if there's, if there's a good news to it, the, the good news that uh, is that a lot of the, the issues, a lot of the side effects for most women, they are reversible, you know, when you stop taking it, you know, there are a lot of things, you know, like a uh, hardening of the arteries, the, your, your risk of hardening of the arteries grows, you know, I think it's 40% for each decade you take the pill. So there are things that are kind of always going to be with you that you've, increase yeah. the risk, but there are a lot of things too, even, you know, even if you're filling them, you know, migraines or whatever that for a lot of women, they go away. Or like I mentioned earlier, if you're not predisposed to lupus, those symptoms may go away. It's, you know, it's basically a drug induced kind of lupus and they may go away after you stop taking the pill. So I think there is, there is a hope for it turning around for a lot of women. 
but I will, that, that makes me want to add a disclaimer. I've had so many women that I've talked to about autoimmune diseases like lupus, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease or whatever. And when they, you know, when they look at that connection and consider the timeline of when they started the pill and when they had their first symptom, it's like, oh yeah, there's no denying this. This is, this is it. And then I'll talk to them later and they'll say, oh no, I talked to my doctor and he said it's genetic disease. So it couldn't have been caused by the pill. And that drives me nuts, but that's a, that's a common thing. Doctors will say, oh no, it's a genetic disease, but yeah, you have to be genetically predisposed to the disease. But, and that was one thing Dr. Rose mentioned in that very first, you know, lecture that, that got me interested. He talked about, yes, you do have to be genetically predisposed, but environmental triggers we're learning more and more are the key to them actually initiating and, and, you know, becoming a problem for, for these patients. Um, So yeah, you do have to be genetically predisposed, but that doesn't mean the pill couldn't have caused it. So. Yeah. Um, So the other, one thing I'd like to circle back around to, you mentioned the reproductive Mm -hmm. and sometimes that just doesn't return at all. Um, With that, so I think there's, there's kind of two things that at least I've seen, and I I don't know, you know, what you found in your research, but both the levels of sex hormone binding globulin. And then the second one is just the pill or well, hormonal contraception alters the cervix, the cervix itself. So it transforms it. So it's not as, it's not as like, it's really not as viable as it was. Right. Uh, I haven't done a lot of research on that. I, I know um, I, I was, I did an interview with Dr. Sarah Hill and I think she did some research on that and she had okay. some, I haven't I'm say, I'm kind of same boat. I haven't read her book yet, but I've, I've heard and read enough of her stuff. I'm, I'm familiar with what she's researched and, and um, it's a, uh, yeah, that's an area I haven't really looked into and but I think she would, she would be a good resource. Um, it's funny. It, I don't know why that like you said something earlier that made me think about, I wish, um, I wish sometimes when women talk to me about the, so many women are, are prescribed birth control for things other than preventing pregnancy, uh, like PCOS and endometriosis. And it always leaves me wishing I was more knowledgeable on helping walk them through other options and things like that. But Holly Griggs ball, I was talking to her about it once and she was like, you don't have to, there are so many great resources out there. All you have to do is tell them there is another option. You don't have to take the birth control pill for everything, you know, look, look into natural options that are out there. And, um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that for these things that I haven't researched and everything, it seems like there's always a, an expert out there who's, who's done fascinating work and, and, and can help guide women, uh, better than what a lot of their doctors are doing. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm so glad that you attended that lecture with Dr. Rose and, you know, that this all happened, um, because, yeah, I think your book and I think your message is very valuable to every woman out there. Um, so thank you so much for your time. As we start to wrap up, is there anything that, is there anything um, else that you would like to share? Well, you know, just what you just said makes, makes me recall, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, how I, I put up these obstacles for myself for a long time, you know, and, and saying, you know, you're, you're not a doctor, you're not a woman, you're not a PhD. And, and so I kind of stopped myself. And then, and because I work in video for a long time, I, my first thought was that I wanted to do a documentary and I kept feeling like I need to find a, a woman to partner with me on it. Cause it can't be a man telling this story. And, and I think those were horrible obstacles for me to put in my own way. And, and I'm thankful it actually, it was the Nelson pill hearings. Um, Carrie love had written an article for hormones matter. And I read it and she talked about the, the Nelson pill hearings. And I was like, wow, somebody else who's writing about, you know, about the Nelson pill hearings. And I contacted her and had a great conversation and she was the one who said, hey, would you be interested in writing some articles about this stuff that you're finding? And I said, yeah, if you think anybody would want to read it. <laughs> so she put me in touch with, with Chandler from Hormones Matter and I started writing for them. And it was it was so great because I had all of this. It was, it was so cathartic in the first place for me just to finally be able to re- be releasing some of this stuff I had been finding, but also just to let go of that, all of those obstacles I had put in my own way to say, okay, people aren't going to you know, they're looking at what you're offering 
and they're seeing the value in it and they're not questioning who it's coming from. You know, they're weighing it based on what you're saying. And so I regret that I spent those three or four years or whatever it was not doing something with this information I was finding and putting those obstacles in my way. And, uh, and we encourage anyone to, to try to avoid doing that, you know, whatever you're doing in life, don't, don't build obstacles for yourself. Just, just do what you feel like you're being called to do. Yeah. That, thank you so much for sharing that, Mike. That's a great message. Um, okay. so how can people connect with you? Um, well, I'm, I'm probably not as active on social media as I should be. I'm on, uh, I'm on Instagram, uh, at, uh, at in the name of the pill, uh, and I'm on Facebook at, at Mike Gaskins. Uh, those are probably the two easiest ways to find me. Um, and like I said, I'm not as active as I should be, but I, I hope to get back into it a little bit more soon. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Brandy. It's been a, it's been a delight.